Good evening, everyone. We're live on Impala Live here with Dr. Paula Kahumbu. And we are going to be talking about elephants and many other creatures tonight. Impala Live is this amazing platform online that allows millions of people to share a little bit of the glimpse of the African bush out here in Laikipia. And one of the important parts of Impala Live is a classroom that children, hundreds of thousands of children can use, uh, designed both for the US and Kenyan schools. And so if you'd like to follow more of this, please look at www.mpalalive.org. -E Thank you. So we'll start off uh, the, ch the chat by asking Paula to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about elephants. Well, hi everyone. I am a Kenyan ecologist and I studied elephants for my PhD. Elephants are probably, in my view anyway, the most magnificent species on planet Earth. They are intelligent, family oriented, they are compassionate, empathetic, um, they laugh, they play, they cry, they mourn, they're so like us, but they're better than us. And uh, my organization, Wildlife Direct, started a campaign called Hands Off Our Elephants to stop the slaughter of elephants which has been taking place for the last five or six years across Africa. Every day we lose a hundred elephants. That's one every 15 minutes because of demand for ivory in places like China, America, Australia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Philippines and those kinds of places. And uh, we felt we have to stop this. So my organization does a lot of work in raising awareness, uh, monitoring courts and trying to reform the court process so that criminals who are killing these animals or trafficking their products get put in jail. So that's what I do. Thanks, Paula. And tell us, what, what made you get interested in elephants in the first place? You know, when I, when I was first invited to work on elephants, I rejected the idea because in 1989, elephants were being slaughtered at such a rate that all the evidence suggested they were going extinct. My job at that time was to do the stock take of the ivory in Kenya. I gave up. I, I actually worked on monkeys for a while instead of elephants. But later on, I joined the Kenya Wildlife Service and I started going out in the field with scientists. And I met amazing people like Ian Douglas Hamilton, Cynthia Moss, Joyce Poole, and I worked with them in the field. And I got a real sense of, I want to call it magic, Elephants are extraordinary animals to work with. They recognize you, they interact with you, they seem to acknowledge your presence and your intelligence. And uh, it's, it's addictive. You really don't have a choice. Once you fall in love with them, you, you just can't avoid it. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. So elephants live in families, like people live in families. Yeah, but elephants' families are very special. <laughs> <laughs> elephants' families, are ruled by the women. The matriarchs are uh, overall in charge. The bulls are um, sent away at the age of about 14. And these young males go off together, they form little groups and they uh, wander about in the plains together. They learn from the other bulls. But the females form these phenomenal, very powerful families. They're not territorial, but they are uh, very, very loyal to each other. They know each other, they recognize other families and they can communicate over distances of tens of kilometers using their infrasonic um, vocalizations. What that means is that they have this network which is like having multiple windows open on Facebook all the time <laughs> and following all your clans and sub-clans and um, relatives over vast, vast distances. Um, that, that gives them um, an ability to understand and navigate landscapes unlike any other land animal. Fantastic. So elephants developed social media long before we did. Oh yeah, we, we have a lot to learn from elephants. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's fantastic. So one of the questions we often get here is about, you know, wh why do we need elephants? There's so many other problems in the world and so many other pressing needs. Why, why, why do we keep elephants around? You know, that question is uh, nowhere more relevant than here in Africa where there is a lot of poverty, where uh, there are diseases, where there is so many other struggles. Um, but elephants are really important for several reasons. First, they are engineers of the landscapes, and that means that they actually create and open up um, bushlands and open up grasslands for other species. 
So they actually play a key role in maintaining Africa's diverse um, habitats. In fact, elephants occur in every single habitat on the African continent, even in the deserts. Um, and they've played a huge role in, in human society. So for example, elephants know where to find water because they can smell it 25 kilometers away. It's incredible. Yeah, and in some parts of Africa, people follow elephants to find water. And people follow elephants with their livestock, especially with goats. For example, in Mali, to find fodder for their, for their animals in very, very harsh climates. So elephants have played a very, very interesting uh, role with humans and our evolution uh, in Africa for, for you know, thousands and thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. But it's really their keystone role uh, in the environment that we can't ignore. Many species of trees, bushes, even grasses require the passing through an elephant's gut in order to germinate. So we will lose a lot of biodiversity, and this biodiversity we tend to take for granted, we assume it's not important, we don't have any value attached to it today, but so many things that we don't yet understand today could be of massive value in the future. And, and that's just the ecological value. Now think about the economic value of elephants. So a lot of people understand elephants primarily in terms of their value for ivory, that their incisors are used for carvings all over the world. Uh, that is not the value I'm talking about. I'm talking about the value of elephants to the economies of Africa, particularly through tourism. So Kenya gets about a million tourists a year. And those people say they want to see two species in particular, yeah. lions and elephants. Yeah. And, and why elephants? Because when you watch elephants, you can't help it. You can't help feeling mesmerized by them. They're so entertaining to watch, and partly because of that family thing. The way that they interact with their own babies, we see ourselves in them. Yeah. And so... Without them, we lose uh, a part of the value of the environment. We lose the value in terms of our economies and tourism. But we also lose a part of ourselves. Yeah. Elephants are really a very valuable part of African culture and our um, societies. They are totems in many tribes. There, there's one tribe in northern Kenya. They, they, it's so beautiful. They believe elephants are our ancestors. They believe we came from elephants. So imagine losing that. Imagine losing part of your identity, yeah. just because somebody half a world away wants a pair of chopsticks made from the teeth of elephants. That, that's why they're so important. Yeah. So we've got some questions coming in from all over the world. Okay. And one of the questions is, do you know how many male elephants there are in an area compared to the breeding age females? How do elephant groups right. structure themselves, basically? Um, it's actually really easy to tell a male elephant from a female. <laughs> Amazingly, it's not what you think. Okay, apart from the obvious. Uh, is, and yes, there is obviously <laughs> the obvious. But um, no, male elephants are much bigger. And their heads are rounder. And they tend to stay aside, apart from the females. Um, and what this means is that we can, we can count the males and we can count the females. Mm -hmm. Now, the natural birth rate is about 50-50. Males, however, do have... Uh, the tendency to move over large distances, much larger than the females. So what will happen is an area will appear to be devoid of the large males, and they're just simply roaming around looking for other females. Um, so they seem to be fewer males than females uh, at any one time, but actually in the general population, they're more or less the same number, males and females. That's, that's fascinating. So we have, we have a group of join, joining us from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Hello, <laughs> and they're a charter school, the ASK Academy, and they're in a world history class. So oh, they're saying, oh, saying hello to you, Paula. <laughs> and so one of the questions that's just come in is, how widespread is a bull elephant's range compared to a female's? And, and can we track an, uh, elephants? How, how do oh, we know what they do and a, where they go? That is a fantastic question. <laughs> elephants are, are among the most versatile animals you know, that we know, apart from ourselves. I studied elephants in forests, and the females moved very, very small distances. You know, in a year, they might move 80, 90 kilometers, you know, in range, in, in uh, maybe a diameter. But the males could move hundreds of kilometers, and that's in a forested environment. But up in northern Kenya, which is much drier, a male elephant can move thousands of kilometers, even in southern Kenya. That's amazing. Around Mount Kilimanjaro, elephants will move thousands of kilometers in a year. The males, they're not really territorial, but the males know the landscape and they will move in exactly the same path. They will even walk on their same footprints, which I find really amazing. They actually know exactly where they went last year. And we know this because you can put a radio tracking device on an elephant. 
Because a bull elephant weighs about seven tons, you can actually put a big packet on a radio collar. So that's a, a necklace with a, a big device with a big battery that can last for years. And you can monitor that elephant's movements every single hour by satellite technology. And we have many, many elephants who are being tracked in Kenya. A lot of them by Save the Elephants. And you can go to their, their website, savetheelephants.org, and you can actually look at the tracks of the various elephants they've been monitoring. And you'll see that males tend to move much more. They will move over vast distances. They move fast at night and slower in the daytime. They will look. They will actually search for safe places. And they will move through dangerous places very quickly. And we're discovering that their knowledge of landscapes and their ability to communicate with each other is beyond anyone's expectation. Elephants can communicate with each other across mountain ranges. Wow, that is amazing. So we think we know how to communicate because we've got yeah. phones, we've got internet. They can communicate through the ground, through their feet, sending vibrations which they can read yeah. on the other side of the mountain. So, so I think it's just amazing. So they've got built-in Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> they've got social media and they've got Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, <laughs> yeah, wi infrasonic. Yeah. So we have a question now about elephant tusks. Right. And it's why are African elephant tusks so much heavier than Asian elephant tusks? And you know, what are the differences between African and Asian elephants? Well, first that they are very different species and that an Asian elephant uh, it's a completely different genus. It's it's Elephas maximus. African elephants is locked onto Africana. Um, the tusks are actually the incisors. They're not the canines. A lot of people think they're canines. Yes. They're, they are these two teeth, right? The front these teeth. guys. They're modified, these guys. yeah. And uh, Asian elephants, only the bulls carry ivory. And for African elephants, it's both bulls and females carry ivory. And from time to time, an individual may not have tusks at all. But the reason why African elephants' tusks are bigger is because they are bigger animals. They literally are just genetically much bigger animals. That's the main reason. Yeah. So we have a question coming in about the impala elephants. But this is a, an impala a general question uh, about elephant diversity. So, are Mpala elephants savanna elephants? And how many different kinds of elephants do we have? Oh, that's a fantastic question. So, uh, I'm going to talk about African elephants in particular. We have two species. We have uh, African savanna elephants, which are the ones we yeah. have here at Mpala. And we have African forest elephants, which is Loxodonta cyclotis, which is a smaller animal that lives in the forest, only recently recognized as a unique species. Mm -hmm. It has a long, thin, pointed tusks that, that go right down to the ground and it's a, a slightly smaller animal. Um, they live really in the rainforest of the Congo. Mm -hmm. and they're very secretive animals. Mm -hmm. They live in smaller groups. They don't have these huge herds that we see in the savannas. And Impala's elephants are savanna elephants and they live in this bush, grassland landscape. Um, but the same African elephant, if you go to Namibia, it lives in the desert. And it's adapted itself to desert conditions. And if you go to Shimba Hills, where I did my research on elephants, or at the top of Mount Kenya in the rainforest, again, the elephants are, have adapted to a different environment. So it's quite extraordinary. If I look at an elephant from Amboseli, it's different from an elephant from Masai Mara. And amazingly, the genetics illustrates that. We can tell from the genes of these different elephants, we can tell exactly which population they came from and what that means is that when elephants evolved, they moved across the continent, but they more or less stayed where they went to. Yeah. So, so the Amboseli elephants are genetically quite unique to the Masai Mara ones and the Chimba Hills ones or the Mount Kenya ones or the Lekki yeah. ones. Fantastic. Well, mm -hmm. So we, we have a question about elephant behavior coming from Rick Ring. And Rick says, you know, I've read that an elephant may acknowledge higher ranking individuals by inserting their trunk into the mouth of the more senior elephant. Are there other social displays of hierarchy ranking that we can watch for on the Impala live cam? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have spent years watching elephants, and they always surprise me. Um, in terms of rank and dominance behavior, you can usually tell uh, by watching, the big dominant individuals will stand and they will display their ears way up. And this kind of a threatening pose. They make themselves look even bigger than they are. And submissive individuals will back off. They will usually be displaced. Um, they will move away. Um, but the, the, the trunks, when they put their trunks together, you know, and they wrap their trunks around each other, that is a 
very much a social display, it's a greeting. Elephants are not aggressive. So there isn't that much of this dominance behavior except among bulls when they're, when they're um, fighting over females, mostly. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time what you see and what you'll see on Impala um, live is wonderful, wonderful exhibitions of social behavior that reminds us how important physical contact is. They love touching each other. And what you will see, which I think is most beautiful, is you'll often see babies, several babies together, and you'll see one female and you'll think, has she got twins, really? Or how did she have so many babies and they're all kind of a little bit older than each other, but they're more or less the same age? And they're not hers. So elephants have nannies. <laughs> and it's a really extraordinary thing. We call them aloe mothers. They look after each other's babies. So the females might synchronize their births. And then uh, a female, an aunt, will be given the responsibility for taking care of those babies. The other. And you'll often see them together. And so it takes years and years of research to actually watch and identify all those individual elephants. And you can tell the individuals from their yeah. ear notches. They all yeah. have unique ear notches. And that's yeah. what you should look for on, on the Impala Live and see who comes, you know, who comes repeatedly to the water hall. Yeah. Um, and you'll, you'll get a sense of who is the, the aloe mother, who is the matriarch, because you'll see the matriarchs usually are the ones who decide when to go, when to stop, when to feed, when to drink. And the others will just simply wait for her to make a decision. Those are the amazing things that we'll be able to observe um, yeah. Yeah, on, on the camera. So we've got a lot more questions coming in now. So okay. one of the questions, a quick question, is what is the gestation period for a baby elephant in a, well, in a mummy elephant? Almost two years, couldn't you imagine? I, I feel so sorry for them. 20, 22 months. That is, that is incredible. Elephants are truly, truly remarkable animals. <laughs> so we've, we've now got, we've got some, some very serious questions. Okay. So with the drought in parts of Africa, with climate mm -hmm. change, has it changed the range of elephants? And will the roaming change, or if it rains enough, will they be able to return to their original stomping grounds? So climate change is obviously a very uh, worrying trend across Africa. And the main reason why it is, is because people tend to move in relation to climate change. And people are the biggest threat to elephants. Yeah. So when um, the climate changes, uh, people start using landscapes differently. And they start farming um, or putting in place structures that get in the way of elephants and their migrations. Elephants generally can move. They can just get yeah. up and walk away. They can walk 20, 200 kilometers in a day. But if there are fences in the way and other barriers, they can't. And so they end up, uh, sure, they end up struggling. And so what you often find is they're in places where there's no water. They need water every single day. And an elephant needs to drink about 100 liters a day. So you can imagine, uh, if it wasn't for the water hole, you know, those elephants wouldn't be here during the dry season. So, so it, is, it is a real concern. And uh, it's important that African governments work together with each other because elephants cross international borders and they create conservation areas that allow elephants to move across landscapes, across different habitat zones, across different altitudinal zones, so that elephants can move freely, regardless of climate change, or it could be global change, or it could just be climatic changes, which are also natural. Yeah. That is amazing. Elephants, like people, are very adaptable. They, they are very adaptable, and um, they're very clever. They're very, very inventive. Yeah. They figure things out very they, quickly. They do, yeah. they do. So we have a, a, a question coming in about elephants in captivity. What are your opinions on elephant captivity? What about breeding elephants in captivity? Well, elephants have been in captivity for a very, very long time. In Asia, they've been used actually in um, industry, yeah. especially in forestry and yeah. logging for a very, very long time. In Africa, much less so. African elephants um, have been taken into captivity and taken to zoos in different parts of the world. They never do very well. It, it's, a, it's really sad that uh, visitors who go to zoos see elephants and what they see is a shadow of, really, and ele elephants have personalities. Elephants, if you think about a human being, why do we not put humans in zoos is because it, it wouldn't reflect a real human, right? It, it would be awful to have uh, a family stuck in a zoo, yeah. or a, an, and a family made up of individuals who have been brought together from different parts of the world. And so, by the way, you guys are a family. Here, here's your cage. Go and yeah. live, and we're going to come and watch you. It's not natural. And elephants need thousands of square kilometers, so it seems to me very cruel to put them into small enclosures. Yeah. 
what we see are elephants um, behaving very badly. Sometimes they kill the people, which is a sign of uh, they've gone kind of yeah. crazy. And sometimes they just get very sick. They die of heartbreak when they lose their their um, their friends. So zoos not, zoos always manage their animals. They move them around and they try to breed them and that kind of thing. And we wouldn't do it to humans. I, I don't understand why we do this to elephants. So my opinion is we should not encourage it. Um, we should look for ways of moving elephants into sanctuaries where they can have a more natural uh, way of living. But we should discourage the, the taking of elephants from Africa. So of late, baby elephants have been taken from the wild because they won't breed in captivity. Yeah. Elephants, like humans, I mean, if, if I put you in a cage, I don't think you'd breed either. Yeah. And, and so elephants in yeah. captivity yeah. don't breed. And so in order to have babies which are cute, which attract people to zoos, they are taken from the wild. They are stolen from the cameras, right, yeah. in the wild. And it's extremely traumatic. Um, many of them die in the process. It's, it's quite horrible. Um, yeah. So I would, I, I feel bad because I know there's a lot of elephants in zoos. I know a lot of people go to zoos. And I just hope that those people who go to zoos, you know, look at those elephants and see what's really happening. And come to Africa. If you want to see yeah. elephants, just come to Africa. Yeah, they're, they're amazing in the wild. Absolutely. So yeah. we've got... Lots and lots of more questions coming in. Okay. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do some elephant facts and figures. How much of the day do elephants spend sleeping and eating? <laughs> they spend almost all day eating. <laughs> they need to eat a lot. Elephants uh, consume about 150 kilograms a day for a large elephant. And uh, they will sleep for about four hours. They sleep standing up, which is pretty yeah. amazing. Most of them sleep standing up, the adults. They lock their legs and they form like a table. Uh, sometimes they will sleep, they'll lie down, um, but they spend most of their time moving and eating. And eating, yeah. How many offspring do elephants have in a lifetime on average? Oh, uh, well, for a, a female elephant can have, can start breeding from about the age of 11. So she'll yeah. be sexually mature from the age of 11. And she could give birth every four to five years. And she will live till the age of 70, but she will enter into... Um, menopause at the age of about 50. So in, a, in her lifetime, and by the way, we've never studied an entire elephant's lifetime. The longest research yeah. in elephants is only 45 years, yeah. right? But they can live till 70. So we don't have that answer yet. Uh, but if you work it out, how many years is that, Dina? You know? From 11 till 50, that's, that's uh, almost, 49 years. Yeah. Divided by four or five years, that's about 10 babies. Yeah. 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 That is very impressive. So we have a question again about Baby elephants. Okay. If a baby is orphaned, do the other mothers take it in? Yes, they do. They're just like us. That's remarkable. Of course, yes. Yeah. They will take them in. Um, there have been many cases where uh, they do take them in. And if a baby elephant is injured or hurt or lost or trapped, they will come back and they will try to save them. They will do whatever they can to rescue them and bring them in. Thanks. So, when is this is a great question. When is the mating season? When can we expect to see the most, most calves on the Africa live cans? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is a great question. Um, elephants don't have a mating season. Yeah. The females will go into sexual um, condition any time of the year, depending on the, ability, the availability of vegetation. Now, it's been really green, hasn't it, yes. over yeah. here? Um, I predict that we will see a bulge of babies in about a year because uh, we had had, we'd had a drought. It was quite severe. Many females will lose their babies because of the drought and then they will come into season, oh, when it gets green again, they'll come back in season and they'll get pregnant again. So I think in about a year or so, so we're gonna see a bunch of babies. And, and if you go to other parts of Kenya, like Amboseli, we already have that. We have over 150 babies in Amboseli right now. That's, that's wonderful. And, and on the cam at the moment, during the hotter parts of the day, the middle of the day, we have a lot of baby elephants coming to play and, yeah. and frolic in the river. So I'm going to ask a question. Uh, we still have lots more questions to get through, but okay. we see the elephant babies playing. Yes. What, why do they play? Why do people play? <laughs> <laughs> because it's fun. Because it's mud. <laughs> yeah. I, I think um, they are... Um, learning how to socialize. Yeah. 
they're learning how to communicate. And uh, if you watch them, they don't just play with each other, they play with everything else in the environment. They will play with the bushes, they'll play with birds, they'll play with buffaloes, um, they will play with your car. They will literally run up to the car and try and scare it. So they're, they're very, very funny animals that seem to have a sense of humor, which uh, I think illustrates their intelligence. They're intelligent creatures, that's why. Right. That, that's wonderful. So we have a few more questions that just came in, and one's a, a serious question. How can I help end the illegal ivory trade? Oh, that is a fantastic question. Yeah. Thank you for who asked that question. We're, we're not sure who asked okay. it, but it's Well, thank came. you for that question. Yeah. It's yeah. a very important question. Um, everybody in the world has a role to play in ending um, trade in ivory. I'm not going to say illegal trade in ivory. I think we should end all trade in ivory. There is no, there is no reason for us to trade in the teeth of an animal as magnificent, as an intelligent, as an elephant. Um, things you could do in, if you're in a country like China or a country where there's a demand for ivory, tell your parents not to buy ivory. If you're in America, you can hand your ivory into the Fish and Wildlife Service. And if you're in Kenya, or many parts of Africa, you can hand your ivory into the authorities, whether it's legal or illegal. Just get rid of it and just say, I don't want to be part of this slaughter that is threatening this species. But you can also do projects in school. You can create awareness. There are some amazing kids in America called Kids for Elephants, and they sell lemonade, and they raise money, and they go on television, and they have their own website, they have their own Facebook page, and they create awareness amongst each other and they interact with children all around the world. I think that ending the uh, trade in ivory will start with killing the demand for ivory. And the only way that you're going to kill the demand is by educating people. And, you know, people need to know that it's, it's not okay to have ivory. It's not okay to want ivory. And it's definitely not okay to buy ivory. And when everyone gets that, the poachers will have nobody to sell ivory to. And elephants will be seen. So we have a question now, again, following up on that the issue of trade. What can we do to help stop the baby elephants that are being taken from their mothers and sold to China? Well, I'll tell you, they're not only being sold to China. Quite a lot of them are going to America. America as well. And uh, many of us wrote to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and complained. Uh, we asked them to say no to the sale. American zoos. They went to three American zoos and there are still more that Zimbabwe wants to sell to these countries. I think children around the world, people around the world um, can do petitions. Yeah. They can write to their local authorities. You can write to your senators and your congress people and tell them that you don't want this to happen. You can also join your local conservation groups, right? You can go to the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York and ask them if you can Help them and you can sign on to letters and that kind of thing. Um, the CITES convention is this massive um, international meeting where they will decide on quotas for trade in many different species and the, the voices of people around the world saying we don't want any more sales of baby elephants to zoos or circuses around the world, that will make a difference because everyone is going to be watching it this September. So. Look, at, look up the dates, go to the CITES website, that's C-I-T-E-S dot O-R-G, and see what you can do. Just send out your message, put it on your Facebook, put it on all your social media, tell your class, tell your friends. You know, let's just protest mm -hmm. any further abduction of baby elephants and sales to circuses and zoos. Absolutely, yeah. We should end the trade in ivory and the trade in elephants mm -hmm. completely. So we have a, a, a few more questions that have just come in. Uh, fun questions. Uh, what is the biggest misconception about elephants? Oh, that is a really great question. What is the greatest misconception? I was going to say elephants, the, the conceptions that I have, you know, elephants have great memories. They have phenomenal memories, much better than we would even, you know, recognize. Um, Are they scared of mice? Oh! <laughs> 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 That's a good one. Elephants probably don't even notice the mice. I don't think elephants are scared of mice. Um, but elephants are very aware of all the other animals in their environment. Yeah. That was a good one. That was a good question. <laughs> How long does a baby elephant stay with the family herd? So, so it depends on uh, if it's a girl or a boy. So boys stay in the herd until they're about 14. And then they're 
they become very playful, quite rambunctious, and their mums say, okay, time to go. And they're allowed to leave. Uh, and they go with the other boys, and they go and they join the big boys out in the wild. Um, the girls stay for life. They spend their whole life with their families. With their family. yeah. that's, that's wonderful. And so they stay with their, yeah. with their mothers, and their grandmothers, and their great-grandmothers, yeah. and their own daughters. Yeah. It's, it's a really incredible you know, huge yeah. generational um, list of, of resultants in one family. Fantastic. So we have a question about how elephants see. Can you explain what an elephant's vision is like? Can they see in color? Do they have <laughs> night vision? So the elephant has the world's longest nose because that's how they see. see. They see with their noses. It seems really crazy. Because if you look at an elephant, his eyes are tiny. Actually, they have very poor eyesight. I don't know if they see in color or not. They might. They probably do. Uh, they definitely don't see very well in the dark at all. But they have the world's biggest ears and the world's biggest nose, and that's for a reason. They listen and they can hear things that you wouldn't, you wouldn't dream of. They hear way outside of our listening range. So for them, their world is in sound and in smell. So their sense of smell is so sensitive, it's 40 times more sensitive than a dog. So yes. just imagine, it's hard for us to imagine, what does the world look like to an elephant? It's, it's a world of smells and sounds. That is, that is amazing. So we have a question, another serious question, it is, is about elephants in zoos. Okay. Is it cruel to partake in an elephant ride? I've always wanted to, but I'm unsure about the ethics of it. That's a, a really difficult one. I was in South Africa recently where they have elephants that have been rescued from uh, being orphans and they do ride them. And a lot of people think it's not fair to ride elephants. I've never personally ridden an elephant. The reason why I don't like the idea of riding elephants is because the training of elephants for riding is very cruel. So the training part is very cruel. And I know that there are some organizations that are uh, using new technologies or new methods which are not cruel. Yeah. Um, so for me, the jury is out. I personally, um, I'm really pleased that the person who asked the question wants to know and doesn't want to do anything unethical. Um, I don't think you need to ride an elephant to enjoy an elephant. No. I think that um, there are loads of elephants around the world that you can meet face to face and they, they get to come to you on their terms. You know, yeah. an elephant isn't going to say, hey, please jump on my back. <laughs> you know, that's just not normal to them. But an elephant will put his trunk out to you and greet you and touch you and explore you and smell you and try and figure out who you are. And if an elephant likes you, it'll stay with you. Yeah. Um, to me, that's a, a much better way of engaging and interacting with them. So with an elephant. Yeah. yeah. And their terms. So we had some questions earlier that have more to do with ecology and conservation that we skipped over. And I'll just go back to those. And So one of the questions that was asked was, are there any interesting studies going on at Impala on endangered species. And I thought perhaps this is a chance to talk about some of the citizen science work that right. you've been involved in, like the Great Grevy's Zebra Rally yes. and the Kids Twiga Tally. Right. Yeah. Well, Impala is such a wonderful place uh, for everyone to come into research, whether you're a child or a scientist from a fancy university or uh, just a member of the public. So we've done two really amazing projects which involve counting Grevy zebra, which is an endangered species, actually one of the most endangered antelopes. Uh, is it an antelope? It's not an antelope. What is it, a zebra? It's a uh, horse like that. Yes. <laughs> it's a horse. Um, and um, using uh, a computer software that can read the stripes of a zebra like a barcode, we can enable anybody, no matter who you are, to take photographs of these animals and then enter them into a computer, and we can tell you if that animal has been seen before or not. It gives us a very accurate way of counting the Grevy zebra, but it also works for the reticulated giraffe and any other giraffe. We have three species or three subspecies of giraffes in Kenya, and the reticulated giraffe is this beautiful, beautiful patterned um, animal that it's so hard to tell apart when you just look at it, but the computer immediately can see them as, it, as individuals. So this is a really exciting way yeah. of uh, getting the public involved in counting and monitoring and aging, doing the sex structure. Yeah. And that information tells us where these animals are, how far they've moved, 
because the camera is a GPS enabled. It allows us to know if the populations are growing or declining, um, which, which areas are doing well and which areas are not. That, that gives us power to now start devising ways of protecting them and involving the communities, the landowners, and everyone else in, in supporting us. That's fantastic. So we have a, another question just came in from Cal Howard. Okay. And Cal asked us, will we be able to save more elephants from those who poach and kill for the tusks? Absolutely. We have, we have um, demonstrated uh, through our campaign, Hands Off for Elephants, something that everyone said would be impossible. So we are normal, ordinary Kenyan citizens, and we said no to poaching and get your hands off our elephants, right? In three years, poaching in Kenya has reduced by 80%, right? So Kenya is this phenomenal success story. Why? Because the public got involved. We started a TV series. We started telling Kenyans to go to the parks. We took thousands of children out to meet elephants for the first time and, and fall in love with them. We took magistrates, judges, prosecutors, investigators, um, all kinds of people to the parks so that everyone could um, fall in love with them the way I did when I was a child. And that has turned attitudes around completely. So a poacher who might previously have been treated as like a petty offender, not such a serious crime, is now going to jail. Yeah. And just two weeks ago, uh, we had this amazing case where a man was trafficking ivory, so nobody could say he killed no because he had tusks. Um, he was arrested over a year ago, he was tried. And two weeks ago, he was jailed for 20 years yeah. for selling ivory illegally. Wow. Now, that sends a very strong message. Very clear message. Very, very clear message yeah. that, that we will not to tolerate anybody who threatens mm -hmm. these animals. So absolutely, we will save elephants. I, there's no doubt in my mind. Yeah. We will save elephants. But it will not be the same success in every part of Africa. Because if you go to South Sudan, they're at war. Yeah. How, how do you save elephants in a country where the people are at war? You can't even go to South, South Sudan and work. Because people are busy fighting each other, um, so there are parts of Africa where we will probably lose elephants, and that is extremely tragic. That is very, very sad. Uh, a sad question just come in to follow on that is, how will an elephant herd react over the death of one of their own? Do they mourn? So we've seen um, many, many cases of poaching and natural deaths of elephants, and it is um, heartbreaking not just for us, but also for the elephants themselves. We've seen mothers trying to carry their babies or raise their babies. We've seen uh, grown-up elephant bulls trying to revive um, other bulls who have been poisoned or, or um, you know, with poisoned arrows or shot and they've bled to death or had infections. And they are so aware of death. It's a very unusual thing to see. They will stay with the body of a dead elephant for days sometimes. They will show all the same signs of, of um, mourning that we do. They will cry. They will, you'll see tears. They will actually cry mm -hmm. tears when, when an elephant dies. But amazingly, more amazingly than all that, they will come back year after year to the place where that elephant died mm -hmm. as a relative. They will find the bones of their own relatives and they will pick them up and they'll scatter them around. So it, it's, really, it's really amazing that they know where the carcass is uh, and it, by now it's just a bunch of bones. They will be particularly interested in tusks and they'll carry them. And I've seen a female elephant holding a tusk and just feeling it and smelling it, and putting it in her mouth and then gently putting it back down on the ground. And what is going on in their minds, we have no idea because we don't do that to humans either. Yeah. You know, they, in so many ways they're like us and in other ways we just can't fathom the emotions that they're going through. So we're, we're getting towards the end of our live chat here. But I, I, I have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Can, can you remember, can you tell us about the first time you saw an elephant? Well, the first time that I saw an elephant. Actually, I don't remember the first time. I, I think that growing up in Kenya, we're so privileged that we've had elephants around us all the time. But I can tell you the most interesting time that I saw elephants. So when I was doing my PhD research, I was actually in the forest and I wanted to understand how elephants alter the forest. How do they choose what to eat and how does that change the 
arrangement of trees and plants in the forest. So I was out playing tape measures, measuring trees. But I had a baby. My son Joshua was only a year and a half. And I had to take him with me into the field. So I would put him on the ground on a mat and he would play and do his drawings. And I would be busy out there with my staff. We'd be measuring trees. And one day I was, I was just about to measure a tree and then it moved. Uh, and I was like, what? And I looked around and there were all these stems, but they were all moving. And it was a herd of elephants. And they had come so quietly to where we were working. And we were so busy, we didn't notice them. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I looked at this one particular elephant and I was about to measure his leg. <laughs> and I looked at him and his eyes were closed. He was asleep. He came, come and stood with us and went to sleep. And so we had to just backtrack him quietly. Picked up my son. <laughs> we ran away. <laughs> and, and, and that was to me was the most amazing thing that they knew we were there. Yeah. And they still chose to come and just come and sleep right next to us. So for the largest land animal in the world, they can move very, very quietly and be very sneaky. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. So we've got uh, one, uh, one of our last questions now is, and I know you're about to go off to celebrate World Elephant Day. Yes. So what's a good way to celebrate World Elephant Day? And how can we all help bring awareness to your work to save the African elephant? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Um, World Elephant Day, this I think is only the second or the third time it's been celebrated. Um, we are celebrating it by going to Samburu National Reserve with a hundred children. And we're going to do science. We're going to teach children how to identify elephants, how to eat them, how to do research. We're going to camp for two days. Um, obviously, not everybody can do that. Not everyone can go out and meet real wild elephants and, and do something like that. Um, so what I've done is I'm going to publish um, a blog on National Geographic. They have a wonderful site called Voice for Elephants. And I'm going to post a blog and I'm going to ask everyone to read it. The blog will talk about what has worked, what's, what are the successes that we should be proud of, what can we pat ourselves yeah. on the back for. Um, and there's a lot of things. You know, price of ivory has come down, some elephants are much better off than before. But there are still some emerging challenges. Ivory demand is moving to new countries like Vietnam, Japan. Um, what do we need to do about that? Yeah. And then we're going to end this blog with um, what do we still need to do? We, we need to stop the demand for ivory. And I hope that everybody on World Elephant Day goes and reads the blog. Yeah. Leave a comment on the blog and tell us what you can do, what you'd like to do to save elephants. And it could be as small as uh, posting something on your social media, telling your friends, doing something in your school, uh, writing a letter in the press, writing yeah. to your congressman or your senator. Um, actually, there are, there's so many different things you can do in Kenya. Children have written songs. They yeah. have performed songs. They've uploaded them onto YouTube. Um, we have had people painting elephants and sending us paintings. They're spectacular. We have had people giving each other gifts of elephants. A ring, a painting, a, a poem, whatever. Gift somebody something about elephants and then they'll know that you really care about them. That's wonderful. There's, yeah, but, many, many ideas. So we, we have some more questions that just came in <laughs> from that. And okay. We, uh, we have a group of people watching live from the Delaware Museum of Natural History. Wow. And one of the visitors at the museum would like to know how many elephants have their tusks taken by poachers each year. That is a very, very sad number. We believe it's over 30,000 elephants are killed every year. That's the elephants that are killed for their tusks. Now, for every mother elephant who's killed her calves, Sometimes one or two will die because they have now lost their mother and their protector. So the number that are killed whose tusks go to China or anywhere else is one group. There are so many more elephants that die just because they can't survive without the matriarchs. That is very sad. But the, the good news is that organizations like Wildlife Direct that Paula runs are doing a lot of really good work in the field, fighting the battle for the elephants on the very front lines. And so maybe as we wrap up, Paula, tell us a little bit about what people can do to help support Wildlife Direct and some of the work that you do. Well, um, Wildlife Direct is a, an amazing organization that is based in Nairobi. I have a phenomenal team and I, I would love everyone to send out 
a tweet at One Life Correct and just say thank you to the team. That is one thing that would really give, give our team a lot of encouragement, especially on World Elephant Day. Follow us as we go to Samburu with our children. We, we do obviously always need more support. Every time we take children to the parks, it costs us between $20 and $200, depending on the trip. So any donation that you make, we will translate it directly into work to get children into the parks to meet these animals and become future conservationists. We also follow up on the bad guys. We make sure that the criminals go to jail. So that is an expensive ordeal that requires a lot of legal support. Um, and finally, we have a TV show. And the TV show is phenomenal. And so go to our YouTube site at, sorry, the YouTube site is called NTV Wild and uh, watch our programs and you'll see a very special episode that will be coming up specifically for World Elephant Day. And there are two episodes which we recently did in Amboseli with the Amboseli Trust for Elephants, which are phenomenal. You get to meet the Kenyans on the ground who are doing the research and they've been doing it for Wonderful. decades. Wonderful. It's, it's, yeah, I'd love yeah. you to to just reach out to any of these groups, support any of the organizations that are doing field work on the ground to save elephants. Well, thank you so much, Paula. We're coming now to the end of our live chat here. Yeah? Oh, thank you to all the, the many, many questions that have come in. We didn't get to all of them, but we'll answer some of them online. And please check back soon with Impala Live tomorrow morning. It's, it's nighttime here in Kenya, but tomorrow morning, the elephants will be up bright and early and performing all their antics and family life on the live cam. So we'll be signing off now and saying uh, good night from Kenya. Good night, Kwaheri. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>